Welcome back, everybody, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. I hit you with video, audio, and with that beautiful written word for those of you who are not allergic to reading and writing. So the video can be supported at patreon.com slash tawahado. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash T-E-W-A-H-I-D-O. You can find the audio with the Tawahado Bible study. And you can find the Tawahado Bible study in the YouTube channel. But the longer version with the intro and the outro are on Google, Apple, Spotify, Anchor, and Transistor. That, those are the podcasts right? And that's focus on scripture. If you want to see me share my notes in the written word on scripture, ridicule politicians, and teach some Amharic for the premium users, you could go to aksum.substack.com and sign up for my newsletter. That's A-K-S-U-M dot S-U-B-S-T-A-C-K dot com. Today, our special guest with us is my brother Orlando Greenhill, aka Audio Discourse, aka the Odd Rocker, aka Habta Selase, the wealth that is given to you by the Holy Trinity. How are you doing today, brother? I'm cool, man. How are you doing, brother? How are you doing? I'm doing well, Xavier Meskan. Glory to God. Xavier, your bark got you. Or your bark Amen. I'll take either one. I'll take either one. I'll take either one. Man, so, uh, uh, man, today I want to do a little bit of a origin story because your path to Orthodox Christianity is so beautiful, is so winding, and you've influenced other people to be on this path through one of my favorite forms of life, <laughs> expressions of life, which is dialogue, discussion, conversations. That You've had so many neat conversations. You and I have been churching together for eight years, so I know you yeah. and I... Uh, from back in the days when we were on Compton Ave and uh, 46th, we used to have these conversations. And and the other Hapta said last year, brother Chris, who's been on this program, he'd say, yeah. I got a little less melanin than y'all, so let's go in the shade, you know, because some of our conversations <laughs> with Sun would go on for so long. <laughs> but uh, wh why don't we go back? Why don't we turn the clock back? And you're a musician by uh, trade and by hobby. So you've also had such a, I think, uh, eclectic is an abused word, but I think it's a true description in regards to you. You've had such an eclectic collection of, of musical interests. Why, why don't you tell us about the various genres that, that you're interested in and the, the, the instruments that you play and, and what you sing? Yes, um, I'm, I'm pretty much all over the place. Um, shoot. How I got into this stuff is definitely my parents, especially my, my father. My father, um, may he rest in peace, may his memory be eternal. He's a musician. Amen. He was a musician himself. Um, and pretty much I grew up around like just having musicians, I mean, uh, music around me. Um, the first performance I ever saw was even my dad playing in the park with his friends, you know, um, in, in L.A., in, in Long Beach, you know, back in the 70s. I'm giving away my age. <laughs> hey, um, shout out to the LBC though too. You're the LBC's finest. Right, LBC man, all freaking forty six of my years in the LBC. Oh man, lovely, lovely. Um, as far as genres and music, I'm pretty much all over the place. It goes anywhere from like um, traditional, like Eastern, like Asian and African music, definitely Ethiopian music, and um, uh, a lot of um, other forms of that to like death metal hip hop and like you know um grindcore a lot of hardcore punk i was i was you know a b-boy i was into punk rock and all that stuff and i'm still both actually you know like i'm i have no shame in being what i am as far as like just the kind of music that i listen to um and some people might be afraid of the stuff that i listen to and even play but I've, i'm <laughs> glad that i've been able to not only like use music as a tool to teach, but I've been on tour, I've recorded with different groups, um, you know, all kinds of different groups too, literally. Like, I mean, shoot, it, it was, touring with bands and being in a band was a, almost like a coming of age to me, you know, like, and, and just, you know, being that young and doing what I was, what I've done. And, and then after that, you know, getting involved in like educational type stuff, more on the music appreciation using a lot of the experimental type stuff that 
me and my friends were a part of, you know, this whole, I guess, free jazz or free form, avant-garde, no wave type. Um, I don't even want to call it a movement, you know, Mm -hmm. as an improviser and a composer, you just kind of like, you're just, as a musician, you just feel that, you know, it's, it's something special to communicate with and you want to share that with everybody. And so that's what I feel like, even the, the games that I've been involved in inventing, like instant band and long beach, shout out to my sound army team. Um, that was basically a godsend. Uh, for me as an improviser to use that to communicate to musicians and non-musicians to basically like get into not just music, but also their creative to know that they could also not playing music. They could participate in anything and, and go at it the same way that a lot of us improvisers do. You know, like I look at improvisation the way the desert fathers would look at praying through certain situations, you know, you play through whatever situation you're in, you know, no matter what happens to the other instruments, no matter what happens around you. You know, I, I, I kind of look at that, you know, I kind of take that approach in, in, in respect to the Desert Fathers too. You know, I've always been an mm-hmm. improviser, but, but with um, the Desert Fathers, it kind of even put that another, in another perspective. I'm so sorry. I don't mean to be so long-winded. It's, this is such a vast thing to talk about. I can go on and on. No, we want you to be long-winded, brother. I have you on the program. I'm I'm sitting here quiet because I'm trying to eat it all up intently. <laughs> Let me tell you, I have a lot of monologues on this channel. And so when I invite special guests like you, I am inviting you to put your modesty aside. And I'm trying to rep you for a second so that you can be long-winded. So please, no more apologies. And there are a number of things that you've said that I could already see maybe two, three different main strains. Uh, We did not plan this out. We don't have an agenda in the way that we're doing it. So it's funny that we are, in a sense, playing an experimental improvisation the way that you mentioned it. My own dialogue and conversations, I have these big picture ideas, but I let it play out organically. And I think that's that that's why people like my channel. It's raw. You don't really see editing. The only editing you'll ever see is if somebody needs to go on a bathroom break. You're not going to see a lot of editing because that's how a lot of cats take things out of context nowadays. So I think two of the strains that we could uh, listen to or talk about in what you've said right there. The one strain is just, uh, uh, again, people talk a lot about diversity these days, but what they don't think about is intellectual diversity. And the other aspect of intellectual diversity is the opposite of that, which is the echo chambers people had. The results of the 2016 U.S. presidential election, and we could get into that, but not too much if we want to later. I think in large part, everybody was shocked in terms of the bi-coastal elite in, in the major cities like L.A. that you and I occupy because people were so insecure. They lacked so much confidence in their own intellectual ideologies that they did not want to be around people who did not pass their purity tests. Now you are walking around in the opposite. You're in an anti-echo chamber. You're in a real rigorously diverse intellectual scene because you're hanging out with poppers, beat poppers, with b-boys with djs with mcs with punk rock people with death metal with grindcore and with people into sacred music those are totally different genres and you know what i mean like yeah not everybody could have you might not see it this way but i see it as a form of confidence a confidence in yourself even now you're, you're bringing up in relation to some of the music you're talking about the desert fathers who do you know in the punk and the metal scene that knows about the Desert Fathers? <laughs> There's very, very few of us. I mean, you know, Turbo, Father Turbo was in the punk scene before, I mean, before he became orthodox, too. There's, there's very few. But, um, yeah, very, very few people. <laughs> it is a rarity to find something like that, you know. Um, shout out to Father Turbo, by the way. Um, amen amen and of course there's the the good folks that you and i both rep their apparel before at uh, death to the world that have yeah. made the argument that orthodox christianity is the last true rebellion for those who mm-hmm. really want to rebel for those because i think that's a big theme in your life i think that would be fair you correct me if i'm wrong 
but that you don't want to be a conformist. Like you're a proud no, black American and you're proud in your blackness, but you don't want yeah. other people to define for you. This is, if you're black, this is what you have to do. C could you tell us, or maybe share any stories if people or cats, you know, been trying to question your blackness because of music selection, because of the way you want to dress or, or maybe even, uh, you know, you've, you've also got a, a part-time career in acting too. You, you've got some acting appearances, you know, I, I know, I know I've, I've felt that in my life, some things I've done, people try to question my blackness and I tell them like, there's nothing I could do action wise that takes away my blackness. Yep. I look at black people as an eclectic people. I mean, like, and so when I understand, like as a kid being a punk rocker, and especially like in high school, and even before that, because my mom was a, you know, pretty much an avant-gardist when it came, because she's a hairstylist as well. I have probably the first high top fade that I've ever seen on anybody besides like the guy from Cameo and Grace Jones. I mean, I was the first kid that I knew that had a high top fade before um, it became a trend. And I, I, the thing is, I got that. People made fun of me. I went home crying. I told my mom to cut it. The next year, everybody had it. And from then on, <laughs> I, just said, I just said, you know what? I'm going to do me. I don't give a care what anybody thinks. I, and, you know, it's a trip. Um, and it got extreme even more. Like every year it got extreme. It went from me having a part in my head. I got into a fight for that, too. Um, to basically me shaving my eyebrows, wearing all black, and, and occasionally wearing makeup or whatever. More like kind of like a, a punk rocker type, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, I, I've always felt like, well, heck, a lot of us innovated a lot of this. As far as black people, we innovated a lot of styles within, you know, um, not just rock and roll, but like even, even visually. You know, like when you look at a Little Richard, you look at Screaming Jay Hawkins, you look at Jimi Hendrix. And there's so many other names. One of the things that I don't know if I, yeah, you know about this. I have a thing called the Black History of Rock and Roll. Basically, was mm -hmm. born kind of out of that, where it's just like, okay, you're saying that this is white people's music, but we've been doing it for a long time, and we're still doing it. As a young black man who was a punk rocker, actually, I'm still I'm a punk rocker. Punk rocker. Um, I basically felt like. I was I didn't understand it as much as I do now after studying our history, so I would really get um, annoyed. And it's I'm not gonna lie and say that it's not annoying. I just know how to go about it because I know there's a lot of things that have happened with us as a people, especially here in America, and and, and just when it comes to how could I say this, we tend as a group, you know, to to basically create and then move on especially if that creation has been co-opted by others um, and we've been kind of shut out of it. You know, when I found that out, I, I began to have more of a perspective like, okay, you know, I get why some people would probably say that, you know, I'm not black in this moment because that's not the black thing to do at this point. You know, there, this could be explained in so many different ways, to be honest. But now I gauge it as a, if somebody, and, and it hasn't happened in a while, but when people do it, it's more like an engaging conversation to where I'm like, okay, you think that this is not black? Well, check this out. This is what we innovated for one. Two, being a black person, you are an avant-garde. You are that, um, that person that creates and still, you know, innovates. Why should I be stuck in anything? I understand. I don't get as angry as I used to be about it because, you know, nobody wants to be told that they're not what they're born. You know, like, obviously, like, I know who I am, you know, um, and even as a black punk rocker, you know, like, I'm still, you know, I am. I can't I can't deny it and I won't deny it, you know, like. Um, but definitely, like, I, I, I came up with that, you know, and me being kind of nerdy, too, was another thing. Um, I believe that God also used even the music to help me feel a little bit more confident. And I'm not going to lie to you. I still study with, with elements of, I guess, kind of a low self-esteem. I've come a long way um, with that. But, I, but music is one of the things that God kind of helped to, to, to um, bring me out of myself. Because otherwise I would be totally timid. The music part, the art part, because, you know, I looked at my, my style of dress as an art. You know, I looked at it as a gift 
of creativity. I used to also do cartoons and paintings and all that stuff too, by the way. Like just I didn't know that. Stuff. That's dope. Oh yeah. I used to do like comic books and all that and painting. And, Bro, and, we, we're know. gonna need you to do some iconography with brother mandela brother haile yasus mm. i also had actually a, a trinidadi iconographer brother amda Berhan, aka winston jack on my program last wow. week those guys are awesome now i'll be honest the last probably visual thing you've seen me do is my disturbulence logo that skull and um light bulb <laughs> yeah that that was a god gift thing for sure you know but i haven't really done any done too much artwork since then you know I, I dabble here and there but not too much but well, yeah that's okay that you know a awesome. big a big theme on this channel is the highlighting of the aesthetics and i think people need to try different things and a lot of people you know there's the malcolm gladwell kind of suggestion that he popularized in his book outliers that a lot of people give up too soon and unless you put 10,000 hours into something, don't say you're bad at it. So the fact that you've put into time into creating logos, into doing art is beautiful. But ultimately, I know where you've spent most of your time is obviously on music. That's the craft yeah. as an individual and in the various communal settings that, that you've been able to do it, that you, you've honed in on that craft. You've put in the hard work, the effort. You've had the patience to do that. And one of the interesting things that stuck out to me is I think the obvious example of what you're talking about is like Elvis, right? Like some black folks will popularize certain music, but it's not palatable people until people until Elvis. I think I think that's one of the big examples of what you were talking about. But what I think is the larger picture behind what you're pointing to is that you had this interest in history. And what what's fascinating about your interest in history, and, and this is where I want to focus in on. This is one of the the big themes I wanted to hit. So I'm I'm glad we're able to segue smoothly. Is that uh, we talked a little bit about the route of the death to the world, folks. Now a lot of times when Black Americans find their way, or even we could enlarge in it to say Africans of the diaspora find their way into the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. It's somehow, some shape, way, or form related to reggae music, which you did not mention, but I'm sure you, you're open to, and Rastafarianism. Now, as far as I understand, you've never been a Rastafarian, nope. and somehow you made it to the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahado Church. Can you explain to us the kind of windy journey of, of how you, you got to specifically Ethiopian Orthodoxy, but even before that, the kind of the larger realm of Orthodox Christianity when, when you were doing a, a survey of things, like in terms of, you know, what, what religious faith did you grow up in and, and what things did you kind of explore and weigh, and weigh on your way here? Interesting. You're going to laugh when you hear this. Okay. This is going to be <laughs> a really weird story and it can go longer, but I'm going to try to do the reader's digest version of it. <laughs> um, how I got into Orthodoxy, uh, Basically, my mom and dad, like, you know, I grew up basically like in a pretty much non-denominational Protestant background, you know, um, yeah. and, you know, like uh, people would say evangelical Protestant. My mom and dad were were of the, the um, you know, they would make sure, you know, they taught us what was up. But at the same time, they made sure that it, they knew that we knew that it was a choice and that they could not be you know, quote unquote, saved for us. Like that was something that as kids that we have to know for ourselves, this is not something that, and so earlier on, like they let me know that it wasn't just something, you know, they needed to, you need to have your own relationship with God, even though it's like, of course they're teaching me as parents, they are doing what parents should do, you know, teach their kids how, how to respect and, and not just, I mean, oh, I'm sorry, how to respect God, but also um, people. Like, I, I learned that all my life, you know, like, and, and but the thing is, um, I had to decide for that. And so earlier on, you know, even it's funny, I'm the atypical punk rocker. You know, I'm a punk rocker, but I'm carrying a Bible with me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most so punk thing you could got, do. Yeah, a lot of cats, like, you know, I had a lot of friends that were atheists and stuff like that or, or into like other stuff that, that was definitely not Christian and it let me know that they weren't. And, you know, we're still friends, you know, like I didn't, you know, I hope, you know, they never 
caught anything like holier than thou from me. From what I gather, they haven't. But I pretty much grew up in that background. And then at one point, especially like because I have, you know, friends and, and, and peers and acquaintances that, you know, at, you know, you want people to know about God, especially like if you come up as a Christian with your relationship with God. So, you know, I wanted people to know about the Most High. And then, you know, I had peers, my peers and my friends and, and then just as other acquaintance, especially like a lot of um, Black Americans. Now they call it the conscious community mm -hmm. um, and just different people that kind of challenged me. And, um, and, and uh, you know, in college, in high school first, but then in college even more so um, when I was going to community college. And so, like, they challenged me, man, and it kind of, I would say kind of shook, not necessarily my foundation, because I didn't question God, like, I knew God was real, and I couldn't explain it to people how I knew, but I just knew that. Even my atheist friends and other people, just certain things that I didn't know um, before that I was finding out, so I'm just praying, and I'm like, all right, God, and I was really kind of stressed about it, you know, you really want me to, like, know, you want people to know about you, you know, like, Tell me what's up, dude. And it's funny. The funny thing is my dad, you know, being the person that he is also, even as a kid, would tell me about just the black presence in the Bible. Like, he just knew that was important for me, you know, or for all of us, really. So it's almost like I could remember certain things that he would even say about Jesus's lineage, you know, and it was definitely a mix. But like, he, he pointed all the black people out in that. He pointed, like, just so many things out in the Bible that, like, I don't think I would have gotten anywhere else, which is why I, I never had any whitewashed or white supremacist or, or brainwashing of the Bible like that, because my dad was really conscious and knew, thought it was important, you know, like, to kind of that, teach that's, that. That's an important point that you're making. I'm going to jump in just to say, and I'm going to let you continue, that there are a lot of cats now in the United States who they will study history like you except they'll fetishize the past in a certain way and they'll bring their white supremacy or their racism into the orthodox church i know you and i have had many conversations off camera about seeing oh, cats yeah. like that and what's fascinating to me is that you have made the very same decision that they have in terms of trying to go back to something but you don't have with you this re reactionaryism or this this sort of false syncretism of a white supremacy that did not exist in in Orthodox Church, especially as it's expressed in 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 Africa. So you, you yeah. can also weave into the story some of those you know um, some of those devils that try to sneak into the church and and bring in yeah. their own propaganda and how you differentiate yourself from that but you're still looking back at history and tradition and all of these things because that's part of the tension. Part of the tension we're talking about is that there's this sense in which being a punk rocker is a radical. Like people love the word radical in that in those yep. communities. And in terms of the Orthodox Church, the word people usually like is tradition. Uh, another word that's usually associated is conservatism. And so s somehow you have both of those things. So uh, you could weave that into your story too. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, and it's funny, even when my dad taught me about that stuff, and, you know, you, I've heard, I had an argument with, I will call him an older acquaintance because I don't really consider him a friend these days, but this guy, you know, he, they, a lot of people don't realize, especially, no, no disrespect to any white Christians that don't think this way. There are certain, especially white American Christians that have this thing where it's just like they don't understand why it's important for a black person to know about his presence and his participation in certain things in history. You know, because for the longest we were taught that not only that we did not matter in anything, but we also were not human. Well, my dad even talked about like just certain black presence in the Bible. It was definitely never on some kind of um, like it was, it was never a thing where he put anyone down. It was more like, well, hey, we're all in this, dude. You know, it wasn't just one people that was in here, you know. And that's, he was the one that I would say that even talked to me about the Ethiopian presence in the Bible. That was one of the things that, that stood out, too. So that stuck with me. And, and 
So at the time when I was questioning, even like God, how could I say this? I started questioning basically like the religion that I grew up with because I didn't have the answers that my friends were asking me. And they were pretty, they were pretty, you know, I mean, I'm talking to dudes that were five percenters, nation of Islam, you know, um, people that like Hebrew Israelite type people, you know, people the various, that were, the various traditions within black nationalism. Yeah. But not only that, I had friends that were non-blacks that were into like all kinds of other stuff too. That were, you know, like, a, a, you know, acquaintances that, you know, I was even playing music with that would kind of challenge me. And, you know, it got me to questioning where I'm like, OK, God, if this is where I'm supposed to be, please let me know. And slowly but surely he started doing that. But not only did he do that, he challenged me. God challenged me in that, too. He challenged me in a way that was bringing me out of myself. Um, and it's still it's still challenging even thinking about it. You know, and it's kind of a long and personal story with that, but it's almost like, okay, here's your answer. He told, it was like, you don't know everything. You won't know everything. Now you're at the perfect place where I need you to be. You're at the perfect place because you're human. You need to accept that as a person and then you can be taught. And it was awesome. And I felt this sort of, I don't want to sound weird saying this. I felt like this peace. And then things started kind of like drawing me. And from then on, I don't, I mean, I've been, how could I say this? At some point I started reading about like, this, there's a book called Black Man's Religion. This book went into details about stuff that my dad had even mentioned. And then I started finding out more details about like the church in Nubia and Egypt and Ethiopia. It was written by two authors, one black, one white. Um, and I'm like, oh, this is interesting. So I'm like, wow. And I also remember, you know, I had, I was never a Rasta, but I had Rasta friends back then, you know, and they were probably the first people that I ever heard even mention the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, even though I still really didn't know about that. Um, you know, I think HR from Bad Brains, one of my favorite punk rock bands, they're all Rastas, by the way, Black American Rasta punk band from D.C., um, he, he had on one of his albums, I guess he, he had um, just, I think he gave props to the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And I'm like, that's interesting. And so, like, I was reading this book, Black Man's Religion, and it went into detail about it. From then on, I'm like, okay, I started kind of looking more into, like, just reading certain things about Ethiopia and Christianity. There's a book called Churches in the Rock that I can't find anymore. When I used to work at the library, I used to see it. I think someone stole it. Um, and all these different crosses. And so I'm like, well, hey, I bought me one of those crosses. And it was a trip because like, I felt like I could use it to kind of talk to people about God because it was not like a normal cross. People were like, what is this? And then we just start talking about what I was wearing, <laughs> even looking as crazy as I did. Yeah, that used to happen to me in middle school, bro. People used to legit ask me if I had a swastika around my neck. And I said, you really think I got a swastika? Or people would say one of two things. Is that a swastika or is that a ninja star? And then exactly like you said, from age 12 to um, you could say 21, like I was asked that question and I was not a church goer. And I but I never like I always identified because I'm a cradle orthodox, but I spent like 10 years away from church, but I never stopped rocking the cross. The cross was one of those just fundamental things I never would stop rocking. And I would always identify as orthodox, even when I wasn't regularly going to church, regularly taking communion. And I was just like, there's a, a staunchness about it. Yeah, it's a trip, man. Like, Where I just not I just like to keep going. You know, I said. I have to be able to reach out to these people. Yeah. I mean, I felt like, you know, even not being Orthodox and wearing that cross, it, it had so much conversation to the point where, I mean, my mom loved it. I actually bought her, her, her one. And I, I have cousins that I bought those crosses for my nieces. I bought crosses for, they really like them, but I've had people, you know, I felt like it was a tool to talk about God, you know, with instead of being hella preachy about it. Not, I mean, you know, some people have that style. I'm not downing them for that. Um, now, it's, the, it's how they're preachy that kind of gets me at times because some people could be very judgmental and that ain't cool. But like, I felt it was just a good conversation piece 
And it's funny because one of those conversation pieces happened when I was on tour with this band that I was in. And this woman comes up to my, to, you know, she was a fan of the band, actually. I'd met her the year before at one of our shows. She comes up, she's like, hey, what's up? You know, I'm like, oh, hey, what's up? And I didn't really recognize her, and she told me where she had met me. She's like, oh, you have an Ethiopian cross? And I'm like, what? <laughs> the only people that I knew, oh, by the way, as a side note, I was reading about the cross, too. I read that it's the first cross that basically represents the resurrection of Christ. That's another reason, because before I didn't wear a cross, like, you know, but that was one of the other reasons that I wore that. And, and just, you know, I thought it was a good thing to, to, to wear because of it. But back to the story, I'm like, okay, who's you? The only people that I know that know about this cross are Rastafarian. You're a white girl from the mid freaking uh, middle America knows about what I have on. And she had a head covering on. And, and she's all, come to my table. Because we all have boots at this festival, Tom Festival, that, um, yep. that the band that I was with was pl at, played at the time. It was like a Christian music festival. And so I go to her table, and all these monks are there. <laughs> One of them now I'm friends with. I, you know, I met him years after that. But I'm, well, he's not a monk anymore, but that's another story. He's, he's still Orthodox, though. But I was like, what is it? She gives me this book. Right when I open it, it just it just drew me in, you know. And and they basically were like an Orthodox mission. It was like the first. It was the first group that put out the Death to the World zine. Um, before my friend Eddie and all those guys kind of took over it. Um, but yeah, dude, it was those guys. That, you know, I didn't come to Orthodoxy via them per se. But, like, they gave me some literature, and then all of a sudden, like, I, you know, I used to kind of, like, snail mail her. Like, I'm not really good at snail mail, but she would send me, like, certain things. Um, she sent me a tape of some Ethiopian music by Mother Catherine Western. You, sh you should get her on your show, too. She's awesome. Catherine that, that would be dope. Uh, but, but hold on. Let me stop you there, because one of the interesting things that I heard you say is that from the jump, the people who you knew about within that identity is like, there's two major branches, right? I normally call it the Greek branch and the Afro-Asiatic branch. Now, some of our Slavonic brothers and sisters might get salty when I call them Greek, but they started in the 900s from the Greeks. So for me, yeah. those are the two branches that people refer to usually as Chalcedonian and non-Chalcedonian, but I don't like that because we're pre-Chalcedonian. We're not non. Yeah. And anyway, I, I think the languages are the best way to identify. But in any event, you saw our Afro-Asiatic communion. You, you said you heard about the Desert Fathers, the Egyptian church, which are the Copts, and the Ethiopian church, which is the Gez, right? But now you're talking about a sister who I assume is of the Greek rite, who I'd say, you know, whether she be Antiochian, that's the Greek church of Antioch, or Russian, or you know what I mean? That's the Greek church of Russia, or the Greeks themselves, the, the Greek Orthodox archdiocese under, uh, you know, the good folks in uh, uh, what used to be called Constantinople. So t that that's interesting because a lot of the other cats we're talking about that were into bringing maybe uh some of the other bigotry for better or for worse what they were looking to was kind of the empire and this empire in constantinople but what you were thinking about was either this sub-saharan christianity in ethiopia or this persecuted christianity in in egypt you know what was funny though to be honest i i didn't know much about orthodoxy even then too much except for what i read in that book I didn't know that there was even a, a division. I don't even know, remember when I, I forgot when I even found that out, to be honest. I don't know if it was before or after I met her. But um, I just thought like, well, heck, you know, the only thing that most people know is the Greek or uh, Greek um, Greek church or whatever. And I thought, well, heck, you know, I, did, I don't know if I knew about the divisions then. Man, my memory is foggy getting old. But um, yeah, I would say through just looking into the church in Africa, like reading about that, and it, it got me interested in orthodoxy. But it's funny because, like, when I met her, I was like, dude, wait, who, how do you know about this cross, dude? Like, and she had me come over to the table and gave me this little pamphlet, and it pretty much, it kind of helped me, dude, like, just kind of to navigate certain things, you know, like, um, when, when it came to, like, just what, 
what kind of like the, the a brief history of the church in some ways, you know, I, I, I uh, man, this happened in like the late nineties, by the way. So it was about like 98, 99, somewhere around that. So I'm just kind of taking it all in. And so when I got home, you know, she actually like, she it's funny. She sent me a, t- a t-shirt that I guess mother Catherine sent her, which was like a, a big giant, uh, Moscow. Uh, and it was in the Ethiopian colors. I, I used to wear that, wear my combat boots and all that stuff, <laughs> um, or Doc Martens. And then, like, what was it? Like, she, she, um, oh, she hooked me up with a dude that um, is the priest of the Church of All Sorrows, um, Father Thomasy. He used to actually have a booth on Venice Beach when Venice used to have cats go down there and they, they could sell anything, you know, on the boardwalk. I've been there for Holy Week. He, he's got the church on Sepulveda uh, yeah. right, right next to uh, this great vegan bistro called Sage. He's yeah. got a St. Michael's yeah. bookstore and by the joy of all who sorrows. I also bought their, their lamentations from Holy Week after I visited so I could listen to the, the kind of Greek rite in, in English, which is another good point, right? So you didn't know about the division at the time, but you're interacting in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s in these chat forums that folks might not know about nowadays. And the thing is, those chat forums are going on in English. The Coptic church, I don't know what their English was like, but certainly the Ethiopian church had begun in, in the 70s and 80s in English. But by the time you are looking into it, there was not a lot of English in Los Angeles. But these Greeks had a lot of English in what they were doing. And I think that's why a lot of cats that you know ended up converting to that church, which is why it's more fascinating without having learned Gittas that that you still, you know, language was not a barrier for you to to find us, even though the other Orthodox who you didn't know were divided were providing you English zines that were even, but, you know, coming off as hip. Funny thing though, Hinnok, you're gonna laugh when I tell you this because this is how much I really didn't know. The first Ethiopian church I went to was actually a Pente church. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. But I knew it was something different. You know, like I was looking for an Orthodox church. And um, I'm kind of jumping around. It's a, it's a long story. <laughs> um, how can I say this? I think at the time where I met Father Thomasy, um, he gave me a book called The Unbroken Circle, which actually David Cole is in. David Scott Cole is in and a bunch of other people, Abba Moses. and also, um, I bought this book called Youth of the Apocalypse. That book really got me. It really got me. Both those books are great, but Youth of the Apocalypse got me. It got me to the point where it just, a lot of Protestants, you know, you use the word conviction. That's, I, I don't really like using that word anymore because it just sounds not cool. But that book, in a sense, kind of convicted me just on me as a person with St. Anthony. And I have another story with St. Anthony in art, too, by the way, that goes back way before I even knew about Orthodoxy. It goes back to when I was a kid in the late 80s. That's another story. So reading You're talking that story, about one of the first monks and that kind yeah. of establishment, Desert Father, St. Anthony the Great? Yes. And I didn't even know that he was, I didn't know, you know, at the time, you know, I found out about him from Max Ernest's Temptation of uh, St. Anthony. That picture in, in the Schongauer carving always got my attention. And it's weird because I always forgot the guy's name. And, you know, I always wondered like, well, man, why is he going through all this stuff? And after reading that story in the use of the apocalypse account of him, it's almost like God was shining the light on me and showing me myself and, and just kind of like drawing my heart to, to not necessarily, well, not necessarily that life in a sense, the way he lived it, but just showing me just, how the bounds could be taken away, like the boundaries could be taken away, and he went beyond that. So look, reading reading that story and then seeing those art pieces, especially the Schongauer counter, I, I started noticing something after I read that story. And this is, you know, I forgot the dude's name all the time. For some reason, he looked like he was, like, really strong, and I noticed his limbs weren't torn. I don't know why that was something like that was a big deal to me. And I look at the title and it says, Saint Anthony freaked me out. I'm like, this is the guy that I just read about. <laughs> and this, this drawing and art has been following me since I was like a kid in the late 80s. You know, like 
reading about a lot of art and stuff, you know, like, so it's, it's a trip. I even got to use art to get me to this point too. Like just, it's a trip. But then like, how can I say this? It's like God was, God was just showing me like just to deal with myself, dude. That's the thing about orthodoxy too. I'm not saying that other cats can't do that. I'm just saying this is what God used for me, you know, like with, with orthodoxy. And he still challenges me to do that. You know, at one point I'm like, man, should I even be a monk? You know, but it's like your monastery is where you are. You have to think about that. No matter where you are is your monastery and it's your choice to live however God wants you to live. It's also your choice not to. And, and I'll be honest, there's times where I've ran away because <laughs> I'm like, I just too raw, man. You know, like, I don't know if I could do all that, <laughs> you know, like. And, and I'm speaking more personal stuff, but like, um, God will deal I, with I you got like you, that. and everybody's getting a taste of it right now during the quarantine. They're getting a taste <laughs> of what it's like to stay in your monastic cell. Yeah. Yep. Your cell is with you, you know? And, and yeah, his, um, and, and to be honest, even be, like before that, I had a disdain for monks and being a, kind of growing up in sort of a Protestant non denominational background. My mom and dad was worried about me at one point because I would always talk about that. You know, like they had me meet with my old youth pastor. <laughs> they meant well, I know. But that just showed me that monks are not like the cowards that a lot of people think that they are. And they're actually facing a lot of the same things that a lot of things that we avoid. Yeah, I look at monks the same way I look at my, my praying grandma. That's what basically they do, you know, like they, they're, they're prayer warriors and they're on that 24 seven. So I'm so sorry. I don't mean to zip around so much, but even with this, like, how could I say this? I think the first Orthodox church service was a few years, even after um, the Tom Fest thing, you know, like after she, you know, I was, I didn't have a car at the time. And at some point, like, I really wanted to, to, to look in the orthodoxy so bad. Like, I, I went to the yellow pages and found something, and there was this two people that were meeting in a high rise. The guy thought I knew a lot. He's all, you should come and serve with us. I'm like, dude, I'm learning, homie. Like, I'm coming here to learn. You know, I don't know how to do anything, man. Like, it was kind of freaky because they invited me to like a prayer vigil for his dead mom. And me coming from a Protestant background, I thought it was kind of weird. And, you know, especially the, the holy kiss I'm next to this lady. Weird, weird but kind of gangster, too. Huh? Weird but kind of gangster, too, to pray for the dead. Yeah, I didn't, you know, I didn't, that was one thing. I struggled, put, put it like this. It took me a long time to actually consider orthodoxy, and that was one of the things that I struggled with coming from the background that I did. And, you know, I'm praying, and then even the holy kiss. So it, was, it wasn't the first liturgy that I went to. It was a, it was kind of like a prayer. It was only like three or four of us in the room. I'm next to this one lady, and I didn't know her. So when they're saying give the holy kiss, I just kind of put my, took my head over like it, you know backwards or something because I didn't. I'm like I don't know her, <laughs> you know. I'm sure I'll, she, she didn't look bad, but I'm like I feel weird doing this, you know. Like, um, and so you know, I never spoke to those well, guys. Well, the holy that. kiss is different, by the way, in different traditions. Even for example, within our communion. The Egyptians or the Copts, they kiss their hand and they kind yeah. of touch another double hand. And the yep. good is right. We just sort of bow in four directions. Yeah. Uh, I don't know which which right you were under. I don't know if it was Greek, Antiochian, Russian. Actually, but how did they do the holy kiss? Because everybody's a little you different. Know what it was? I have my black it Catholic was... friend on and he told me the different ways in which black Catholics do the, the, the holy kiss versus like the Irish or the Italian Catholics. Actually, this particular church is, is, is kind of an outsider Orthodox church. It was kind of like a Roman Rite, Augustinian Orthodox type thing. That's what he said he served under. And I just felt like, you know, it was no disrespect to him. He meant well. I just felt like I didn't want to go back there because I just didn't really know. And I think he, he was impressed that I knew I just by reading to the point he wanted me to come and serve. And I'm like, I don't know anything about this, dude. So through that, and at one point, I, 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 I was in the hospital, just, I guess, paying a medical bill or something. And I had that Mescal t-shirt on. 
And, you know, I've been reading about Coptic priests, I mean, I mean, Coptic church and all that, and Ethiopian church, and so I'm looking at this dude, he has a long gown, a huge cross, and a beard. I'm like, no way, dude, no way. I felt like all star studded. And he's reading the funny papers. <laughs> I'm like, dude. And I go over there looking all punk rock with my freaking cross t-shirt on. And I'm like, hey, dude, are you like an Orthodox freak? <laughs> He looks at me and smiles and kind of nods. I'm like, dude, like, where do you go to church at, man? Like, you know, I want to check you guys out. He, like, gave me the address. And so, like, a year later when I got my car, like, I went over there. And, and that actually was the thing that made me come back to Orthodoxy. That's where I went and, and, and basically partook in the first liturgy. I mean, I wasn't back. What type of liturgy was that one? It was a Coptic liturgy. So the first, the first, um, Kadasi I went to was actually a Coptic one. It was Ara- from- what was the balance of uh, Coptic, Arabic, and English? You know what? They actually were pretty balanced. Like like back then, I remember even the first prayer book that I got, I, 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 I think I still have it. It was a Buna Bashoi Brownfield, who also knows Deacon Cole, too. Um, a Buna Bashoi Brownfield. The guy that I met at the hospital was Abuna Mauritius. He's still over there at St. George. So I went over there. Um, and I'm just, I, I go in, I walk in, and with him and, and my friend um, uh, uh, Andrew Shenuda, who I met then, I met him, I mean, this is the first liturgy I ever went to, and I'm, I, I'm kind of, he's all, hey, you got a front row seat, check this out. He, you know, he looks kind of like a biker with like a, 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 a miter hat on. <laughs> you know, like, um, and he's actually an American, uh, uh, Anglo-American type dude that was a convert as well, so he. He, he, you know, we're still friends and all that stuff, too. He gave me a liturgy book, had me sit in the front. Dude, I didn't know what to expect, but by the time that I got out of there, I couldn't go back to the church that I grew up in, man. And it was no disrespect to that church, because I learned a lot there. But this, to me, when I start, first saw the liturgy, dude, like, it was like, okay, this is how, you know, even the ancient Hebrews worshipped. But this was like basically like the ancient Hebrew worship, like I don't how can I say this? The ancient Hebrew worship, as far as like the Messiah has already come. You know, the only difference, of course, you see the 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 the, the, the veil is 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 you know you see behind the veil and all that. And so it was almost like my mind was blown. Like I couldn't. Yeah, it's it's heavy on the Psalms. It's liturgical. It's heavy on the Psalms. Yeah. The the heavenly temple is fully in picture, and the sacrifice is is now the Eucharist, which is the communion, the flesh and blood of our Lord, which is always center. Yeah, man. It's funny that I even caught that because I feel like I don't know as much about that as a lot of other people know. But I just, that was the first thing I was where the New and Old Testament meets right. And it and, and just blew my mind. And it's like everyone's praying and singing, you know, praying at the same time. I'm like, this is, where it's, this is how they did it back then, dude. I couldn't stop coming. I, even with my, from then on, it took me 10, it took me about like 10 years until, um, I ended up converting, or actually 13 years if you want to count me being a catechumen. But that, it took me, like, what kept me going was that liturgy. I could not go to the church that I grew up in. I could not go to a Protestant church. I couldn't even go to a Catholic church. But Wait, hold on. Let's pause. You were, you were attending liturgy for 13 years before the full baptism? Yes. On, uh, on Pascha, on Pasica? Yes. I had a lot That's of questions. Amazing. I had a lot of questions. And for me, like, like... Even some of my friends, like we would get in the conversations, like Mike Vinger, you know, you know, Mike, um, Dr. Mike, he, he was on your program. He's yeah, he's been on his program, Dr. Michael Winger, the Syriac scholar and uh, semeticist in general. He always makes fun of me. Yeah, that's that brother. He always makes fun of me. He's like, man, you all, you have a drag every time you always say, man, you you always end up co- getting people converted by by basically saying I have a question about this. You know what you're doing. I'm like, dude, I haven't even I haven't even like converted myself. I'm just asking questions because a lot of the people that I would ask questions um, to, like some of them ended up even being converted, and even some of them are serving now. It's weird. 
me and Turbo kind of started looking into that stuff at the same time before we even met each other. That's a whole other story. Anthony Case, you know, he served uh, at St. Mary of Egypt. By the way, Father Paisi has played a huge part in me coming into Orthodoxy too, because I would talk to him via email. He was one of the, he was the first priest that I actually met um, just because like, I didn't know who else to talk to. And somehow I got a hold of him. We would always talk on Hotmail back in the day. Um, so it was like, you know, the, 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 the um, St. Mary of Egypt church is really special to me because they, you know, those guys, what they're doing in their community, as well as like, just, you know, Father Paisius' patience to explain a lot of that stuff. My friend Anthony Case, who lives back there, I met him when I was on tour with Havelina. He was in a band called Waterdeep. We became friends. And then at some point, both of us were in the band Christ the Far Eye at two different times playing the same instrument. Then we end up finding out that we're looking in the orthodoxy. So it was weird, all these parallels, you know, like just, I ended up talking to another friend of mine at this Gothic festival, and he was a Protestant. We're probably the only two Christians there, I think. Um, and he was in a, 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 a really a legendary underground goth rock band, kind of a post-punk band back then, too. We're talking about this stuff, and he was more on the Calvinist kind of like reform theology thing. He ends up converting before me. And I'm just asking questions about all this stuff. I don't blame myself. You know, Mike does. <laughs> But this is this is how long it took me, dude. You know, it took me a long time to even consider orthodoxy because I had questions based on because of things that I grew up in a Protestant church with. Like I had issues with Mary. I had issues with praying, praying for people um, that have passed. Now I don't. I don't have issues with either one. And it just took time. You know, like um, I know also not everybody's going to understand it. And I'm not going to understand everything because that's one of the first things that God taught me even looking into this. Appreciate the human being that you are, that you are unique and you're always going to be knowing. I mean, I mean you're always not going to be knowing everything. You're always going to be learning wherever you are. It's going to be a journey no matter where you are. That's kind of like salvation, too. You know, like salvation is a I have a song called that on my grindcore band. <laughs> but that's another story. So yeah, shout out we, we, won't, we won't plug it. We won't plug it when we close. So yeah, that's, um, I, I tried to get the reader's digest version. I know it could go longer, but yeah, how I got no, into no, that. So, that, so that's good. I want to go back to, I know you mentioned that you said you struggled with low self-esteem and others do it, but I want to point to what I believe are the moments of confidence or whether you want to use that old term that you said was more Protestant leaning conviction, which is some of these cats that you are asking questions with. I remember one time you told me a story about somebody who was probably a self-described Satanist and the way they try to express their Satanism is by having an upside down cross. Why don't you tell us about the kind of milieu that you were with with them and how you kind of confronted them with questions. Because I think that's a great example of Father Thomas Hopko's speaking the truth in love. And you began with a, a sort of Socratic questioning of that imagery. And I think the heart of Christianity has always been counter-ideological. You, you see the Old Testament as a response to the Macedonian Alexander the Great's conquest of the known world, and especially through the translation of the Septuagint, presenting an ulterior message in the form of the prophets, you see the New Testament through Jesus Christ expressing this countercultural, counter ideological message where this death cult, which is the Roman Empire, is spreading the cross. The cross was the number one thing that inspired fear and terror in the hearts of people. Now, 2,000 years later, people don't remember fear and terror. When they see that, that death sentence, which was the cross, they see a message of life, a message of hope. And so I think that you are in a proud, long tradition. You and I have talked in our Sunday school. Now, uh, Orlando's a, a Sunday school teacher in his own right, but he participates in my own little Sunday school services in the virtual realm during the quarantine. And we commented on something I told you I learned from you, that in that same proud tradition of counter ideology, you have the Copts who we mentioned and whose liturgy mesmerized you. 
using the pharaonic chant, the pharaonic chant that was used to bury the pharaohs, the, the language of the hieroglyphs, they spun that language, they spun that melody, and they used it for the Golgotha. What pharaoh was buried with his slaves and with his wealth, it's flipped on its head to bury Christ on Good Friday. You also hear them in their midnight praises on Saturday nights talking about how glorious it was that God had the song of Moses and Mary and saved the Israelites from the hand of Pharaoh and buried Pharaoh and his chariots, meaning his imperial power in the Red Sea. So I think you're in that line. So tell us the story of the, the upside down cross Satanist and, and how you flipped it on its head. Yeah, you know, like a lot of, you know, you get a lot of cats that, you know, especially at shows, you, you know, we're all into the same kind of music and all that, crying or death metal, some cats are in the black metal and other extreme forms of that. Um, and some people think that, you know, it's a shock basically to wear an upside down cross. And there's been a few times where I've actually kind of like, hey, nice St. Peter's cross, you know, like, and, <laughs> and it kind of throws some people they off. They weren't ready. You know? And because and, a lot of times, it, uh, it, you know, it's a lot of times like Castle wear an upside down cross basically to deny, to deny Christ. And I get it. But at the same time, it's like you can't. So then they, and I'm not saying that I'm not encouraging Cass to do that. But like, it's just more of like, well, hey, I think it was, uh, yeah, you know, Peter turned himself upside down, upside down on the cross because he felt he wasn't worthy to die on the cross. So it's funny, now you see people that, like, the, the newest thing, you know, probably within the last, I don't know how long, I think like 10 years ago I started seeing it, maybe even longer than that. They would put like a pentagram on the cross, you know, the upside down one, obviously, and just to see even, to make it even more blasphemous. And I'm like, well, you're still doing the same thing, you're killing it. <laughs> you know, like, the cross is a symbol of death, you know, like, when even you see... Jesus on the cross, basically, he's showing you that he died for you. You're putting a pentagram on the cross. I mean, you're basically trying to kill it. Now, I'm not going to be wearing a pentagram on an upside down cross anytime soon, but I just think it's kind of funny how, like, if you really hate something, you wouldn't wear it at all. You know, <laughs> like, you have, a, you have an upside down That's cross. Right. You know, like, that doesn't scare me. It doesn't shock me, especially because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with where that comes from. Also, I'm into the same kind of music you're into. So, you know, like, I get where you're coming from. <laughs> you know, and it's not like a thing where I'm, I'm better than them. Not at all. Not at all. You know, I just, for me, it's just more like, well, hey, you know, like, that's something that, even though you meant it to be unholy, you're still kind of actually giving it praise, in a sense. You know, like, like just, if you it's, really it's, have a problem uh, with it, don't the, worry. The kids no. these nowadays, they say, you're letting Christ live rent free in your head. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, shoot, if you were, yeah, basically it's just, how can I say, I just like to use stuff like that as a conversation piece. And, you know, I don't come down on cats like that. I'm like, hey, that's a nice St. Peter's cross. And people are like, huh? And then some, uh, 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 there's a few times where, like, a few people get it. And then some people are like, yeah, man, see, I told you this wasn't evil. Like, you know, like. But yeah, and that's part. beautiful, Orlando, because what you're doing in that moment is like that is an objectively funny thing to say that you know damn well that they're not trying to rep St. Peter. And so you pointing out that it's a St. Peter's cross, that's humor. And for me, you have to use humor to ridicule someone who's trying to spread death, someone who's trying to spread fear or, you know what I'm saying? So that the usage of humor to, to ridicule, to emasculate the people who perceive themselves as, as powerful is, I think, a, a very useful an instrument and tool. Now, I don't remember when exactly your baptism was. I imagine some 10 years ago or something, but that means you've been kind of considering and reflecting upon Orthodox Christianity for, it seems, a couple decades, if not, if not more. And so I think that some people get interested in an idea, and we see this even in the kind of popular Orthodox circles, right? Uh, I think we saw this with Frank Schaefer, who's trying to make a quick buck in, in other ways and, you know, sold a book about how he's atheist, but he's still Orthodox. So you see some people convert, but they, they burn out. 
and, wow, and they, they have this <laughs> they they have this literature right they have this literature where they call it passion fatigue or or passion burnout for people who work in social justice fields where sometimes you know you just run into enough suffering and you you kind of you fizzle out you know maybe you got too close to the sun if you want to use the old greek mythology and so i think a good way for us to close today would be if you could impart for us advice and again i want you to to put the the modesty aside for a second you know we'll, we'll let you do that in private but here on the public channel go put the modesty aside and give people advice how they could keep chugging along the road of orthodox christianity maybe motivate them in some sense or inspire them with how you've been able to think about this and continue this path for for this long oh shoot that's a good question um I'm still learning. That's the thing. And I would say, like, know that you're not God. And yes, I know that there's a verse in the Bible that says you are like God, but also says you'll die like men. I'm not trying to be a joy kill. And even, like, mentioning my the struggles that I've had with low self-esteem, God will use things to help you bring stuff out of you like that. Um, and, and just know that you're a human and that, not to say that you don't have any capabilities at all, you do, but you can only have the capabilities in the presence of where you are. You know, I learned that even, you know, Abba, our, our Abba Thomas um, has, has, you know, reminded me about that at times. And, and you know, he had a book called, uh, 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 man, what's the name of that book? Bread, Wine, and Water, and, and Oil. Oil, or something. oil. oil. And, and it talks about that, you know, um, and just... Basically know that like God is who he is and you are who you are. You're a human being as an agent of time. And the only thing that you can do is function in the present. You can't function in the past. You can't function in the future. You can reflect on your past and prepare for the future only in the present. That's the only thing that I could say. And I'm still learning to do that even now. Even with my own personal struggles, I have to think like that because a lot of times I don't. You know, and, and to be honest, it's humbling because, you know, it, it makes you respect kind of like just God even more. But also you kind of like, you, 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 you feel, how can I say this? You sympathize with humanity a lot. You know, like I have friends that, that struggle with depression. I don't. I have friends that struggle with other things that they can't even tell, like, people that they love because like they have these struggles and you know it makes you to think about them and pray for them you know even when you're going through your own struggle and even if you totally feel like a certain way you know like if you're all pissed off or whatever you know God will always bring you back to that you know like just know that you're a human being and that human being that's a good thing because you could only do what you can do in the present. And I, what I'm saying, even in that, it doesn't mean that you just like don't do anything. It means you have a lot, you have what you can do at that time and in that moment, and you can still prepare to do the next. And, all, and, and like even what I said, you're going to hear this thing, you know, like you're going to hear this video or whatever it is. <laughs> It'll be recorded, but I'm saying everything in the present. Like what I'm saying right now is where I am right now, you know, and I'm going to probably say some other stuff in the future. But, yeah, just know that God is who he is. He's beyond your future and present. He's lived outside of time, space, energy, the universe, everything. But he's right there with you. He's in the world, but not of this world. He's universal, but particular. And I mean, he's beyond the universe to me, you know, um, but he's still particular because you could only meet him in that particular. It's, it's our minds cannot conceive the way God, our, our minds are not higher than God's, man. You know, it could never be that way. And that's not, it's not a bad thing. 
it just shows how unique you are as a human being. And you can always still learn. There's always something to be learned. That's a humbling thing because we don't know everything. And we will know only in time. We seek because we don't know. We seek in the present. I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't mean to sound like hello, like like I'm deep or anything. I'm I'm struggling to get my thoughts out because I don't want to be misunderstood. You know. <laughs> no, that's that's real, bro. And as we as we sign off here, if you have any movies or commercials you've been in, any music projects, any projects at all that you want to plug, plug them in right now, and then we'll sign off. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to plug my friend's clothing company, Kingdom Come. Um, Kingdom Come Designs, really good guys. Um, and they have a group called the Salafis. Um, that's Shai- yeah, that's Instagram. our brother Shiloh and, and Jeshua. We're going to have to get them yeah. on the program too. Yes, really good guys, good family. Um, I am, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> how can I say, I'm the controversial dude on YouTube, audio discourse, and also Black History of Rock and Roll on YouTube, Instagram. And Facebook group audio disc. I'm sorry, Facebook group Black History of Rock and Roll. I have my own music on my SoundCloud, Orlando Greenhill. Also, if you want to see anything that I've done, somebody I didn't do this. I don't know who did it. I didn't even remember some of the stuff that ended up on there. You can go to the Discogs page and actually look up my name, and you'll see a bunch of recordings. I seriously don't know how everybody, whoever did that page, did a great job. Thank you, whoever you are, because I forgot about some of that stuff. Um, and <laughs> I'm also, um, um, odd rocker one on Instagram. If you ever want to like talk to me or have any questions or whatever. Um, I forgot to mention how I ended up in the Ethiopian church though, but, um, I guess oh, you, you, know, you could hit it. You could hit us with that. Actually hit us, hit us with that. We can make it brief. Hit us with the yeah, final conclusion of that. And I'm going to ask you to throw one more thing in that I just thought of right now. When I was thinking about all these uh, aliases you have and projects you have, uh, <laughs> you're also one of those people. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, sorry that y'all, we, we had some technical difficulties. So we went audio this time, but it's audio discourse. So that, that works with the name. <laughs> Next time we'll go video. But I wish you could see this man's face. And I'm going to probably throw a picture up for the YouTube. Um, and we'll throw the links up so they could definitely get a picture of you. But you're also one of those rare cats who gets mistaken for so many different type of doppelgangers from yeah. people who are women <laughs> to people who are the most scruffy fighters. And so just yeah. uh, talk to us how you got in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and all the crazy different doppelgangers you've been uh, mistaken for <laughs> or people say you look like. And we'll close with that. Yeah, man. Well, I went to every Orthodox church you could think of. Thank God. Like I have a lot of Coptic friends and and friends all over the place. Shout out to all the homies in every Orthodox church that I've been to. St. Barnabas, St. George, you know, uh, um, Abuna Lazarus, you know, all those cats, you know, everybody, St. Anthony Monastery. Um, But it's weird how I found out about the church that we go to, Enoch. Um, There's a, a lady that was on this, group that I started called Lovers of Truth on face, uh, or, or, yeah, MySpace. And that's where, uh, man, that, that whole group actually helped too. Um, she talked about Virgin Mary. Um, I went, I ended up going to St. Mary because I, I, I didn't really know how, I got the streets mixed up with the Compton Boulevard and Avenue. And then at one point, Boston I didn't Ave, have a car. Boston Ave versus Compton Ave. Yeah. <laughs> But somehow I found out a few years later and then ended up taking the blue line with my skateboard. And then when I came, it was like, it was like I had a rest, you know, like basically like I I felt like I was supposed to be there, you know, Um, you know, I felt at one point I wasn't sure, but then it just kind of rested on me. And so that's, it's funny. I started kind of looking into the Ethiopian church when I looked in the orthodoxy and then I ended up being there. Like that was just somewhere that God, wanted me to be you know um man <laughs> oh yes i <laughs> i have a lot of doppelgangers um the the, the picture that hinnock is talking about two of them are women and there's one white dude <laughs> and steve <laughs> what the heck um so it's, and it's kind kimbo of weird. slice bro and kimbo slice yeah like. yeah kimbo slice chris rock um david chappelle um 
the, the MC ride from Death Grips, uh, skin from Skunk and Nazi, who I actually think is beautiful. And I'm like, I look like her, but I can see how people could say that. Um, the chick from Echo Belly, uh, who else? Dudley from Different Strokes, Shamar, um, I forgot his last name. Um, Shavar Thomas, that's his name. Um, dang, there's one more cat. But like, yeah, I, I got a lot of cats that I look like, and it was weird. You know, two of them are women, and one of them was a white dude. <laughs> they call me, you know, it's just funny, man. So it's just, yeah, it, it's the trip to, to kind of have, <laughs> like, who are you? Someone in one of the one of the videos that I, I was on, they're all dudes, freaking MC Ride was in this. They're laughing. I'm like, that's not him. It's funny thing. MC Ride's in the band Desperate, by the way. Funny thing is, I know the drummer from Death Prince, and I'm like, I wish I met MC Rise before I cut my beard so we could have at least taken a picture together. But yeah, <laughs> I, I get a lot of weird stuff. Well, that, that, that's a beautiful way, man. There's no more beautiful way to end. Thank you for coming on the program. And, and anytime, we can have a million different subjects we could chop it up about. We could come back and do like the history of bebop and 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 everything if you want and pop in once we get the video going so we could actually get the visuals of of you performing. Yeah, man, and, and you guys and Hinnock, I'm sorry, like if there's any kind of like sometimes like I get so overwhelmed with trying to make sure that I'm clear, like I might I might kind of slip over my words. So if anybody has any questions, please let me know. <laughs> you know, like. I really no, appreciate it's been, it. It's been good, brother. And and we'll we'll throw up the send me the links and we'll throw up the links on the YouTube too so folks could reach out. Have a blessed evening, brother. God bless. Thank you, man.